Hi, Michael. Hi, Nicole. <laughs> Yesterday we were talking about Satyagraha. Satyagraha, yeah. And I was wondering if you could talk more about how we can learn Satyagraha as a science. Oh, yeah. You said we could in part? That's right. Um, <clears throat> it Partly, Satyagraha is like any other field. It has a history and has a theory. And um, there are certain key individuals who made contributions to it. Gandhi, of course, King, uh, Aung San Suu Kyi, and others. So uh, what I've done teaching it at the university is I've given people a historical background, run them through, and then try to give people the tools to analyze the history that they're reading. And that's quite important because you can kind of gloss over an event and miss a basic principle if, you're, if you don't have the right framework. So you can learn the theory, learn the philosophy behind it. You know, just we have a world picture that is the philosophy behind violence right now, there would be a different world picture behind the philosophy of nonviolence, Satyagraha. And, uh, yeah, uh, Gandhi even said, it is possible to reason out the existence of God to a limited extent. Mm. But there's a point beyond which reason is not going to avail you anymore. Mm. And that point comes uh, in Satyagraha learning when you have to practice it. You have to test out the principles that you've been learning in your daily life or in a political campaign, then you have to sit down, you know, it's just like robbing a bank. You have to sit down and say, what did we get right? What did we do wrong? Mm -hmm. So what are some, like, concrete tools or ways that it can be carried out, or how did Gandhi carry it out in a concrete way? Yeah. Yeah, he was a great one for coming up with these rules and principles. In, in the course of uh, his campaign in South Africa, he identified the principle of... Uh, uh, what he called progression, the law of progression, which states that if you play your cards right and you're doing your activity in the right spirit, it'll grow. Mm -hmm. And then there are laws for carrying it out, like no fresh issue. You even see that in the Attenborough movie when uh, uh, they say to him uh, that we're going to have to limit in immigration of Indians into South Africa. He says that was not an issue on which we, and he almost says, on which we fought. Mm -hmm. Well, he said, no, I'm sorry, he says, that was not an issue on which we fought. Now that we have, and he's about to say won, when Athol Fugard looks at him and says, you know, don't you dare say that you won. So he crosses that out and says, <clears throat> now that we are in a position of advantage, so that's very important, and many campaigns have been ruined because people gained a little bit and immediately they threw on more demands. And what they're doing is they're not looking upon the interaction with the opponent as a conversation. Mm -hmm. They're looking upon it as a power struggle. Mm -hmm. The minute you go into a power struggle, you're not doing Satyagraha anymore. Mm -hmm. So that was one important thing. And then uh, similarly, uh, non-triumphalism, Martin Luther King was very good on that. When you've succeeded in a major campaign, like the bus boycott, you do not do what an NFL football player does. You know, you don't go, because <laughs> you're not uh, grinding your opponent's nose in it. You are saying, good, we've arrived at an agreement. Now let's go forward mm -hmm. as friends. And that's a direct quote, actually, from Nelson Mandela. Mm -hmm. uh, and then there are, there are strategies that you can work toward. One I like to call a stealth strategy. You don't immediately want to push in your, in your opponent's face the full weight of the threat that you're actually offering. Perfect example of that, in fact, this campaign is a perfect example of almost everything, mm -hmm. is the Salt Satyagraha. Uh, the Viceroy of India literally said, I am not losing any sleep over the Salt campaign. And in a couple of weeks, he had lost the entire empire mm -hmm. over it. So just as in a military operation, you don't necessarily say, here we come and we got this much power. You know, you, you can kind of bring the opponent along to a position where it's a fait accompli and with a minimal amount of suffering, you can score your point. Um, and so most of these techniques are pretty logical once you start from the proposition that you're not against the person, you're against the issue. Mm -hmm. Your real goal in the end is to make an enemy into a friend. Mm -hmm.
Thank you. You're um, also, yesterday you gave us a really thorough um, explanation of all the different roots of what Satyagraha means. Mm -hmm. um, and you casually mentioned that it's often defined as soul force. Um, I was wondering if you could speak a little bit more about why it's called that if the if the root words don't necessarily show that and then also is there like any close english translation that we can wrap our mind around whoa thank you nicole those are two really good questions i am i'm a language person you know i was that's what i did for a living so i i like to look at the words and their etymologies but people used the term soul force because they wanted to differentiate it from physical force. So this is the force of the soul. In fact, I had a friend who was talking about nonviolence in Africa one time. Nobody knew what he was talking about. So he said to these village women, how many of you have ever used a moral resistance to a physical threat? Bang, you know, three quarters of the hands go up. Mm -hmm. So that's something that people can understand. Mm -hmm. The soul, though we don't know what it is, there is a non-physical influence that people exert on one another and so it's appropriate to call it soul force. Mm -hmm. Now you could argue that satyagraha means clinging to the ultimate truth, and the ultimate truth about us is that we are spirit, mm -hmm. you know, much more than we are body or mind. So, you know, you could kind of jimmy the argument that way. Mm -hmm. But I think people called it soul force because they wanted to say, we are not going to use weapons, we're not going to use financial pressure, mm -hmm. we're going to appeal to you. We're going to appeal to you in your human conscience, mostly by our suffering. That was another law that Gandhi came up with, the law of suffering. If you really want to get through to people and they're not listening to you anymore, you have to make yourself a lightning rod for the suffering that's going on in the situation. Mm -hmm. And that will or will not wake them up. Mm. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Do you think that maybe soul force is an appropriate English no. translation? Or is there something missing in there? Yeah, no, it'll work. It's, uh, it's not a translation of the literal meaning of the word. I've coined the term obstructive program because that will give you a nice balance between constructive program, where you build what you want, mm -hmm. and obstructive program, where you resist what you don't want. Mm -hmm. And the two things should be in balance, and you should know when to use which. So, But I can't say the term obstructive program has swept the world. But it's, it's useful, and I think soul force is also kind of useful. The whole question of nomenclature in this field, mm -hmm. it's very difficult. Because mm -hmm. the field is new, the concepts, the main concepts are not in our paradigm. Mm -hmm. We have to shift the whole frame. Right, yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, and the last one. Okay. Um, you mentioned that Gandhi said, and I'm paraphrasing, um, that in no situation does nonviolence fail. Yeah. That perhaps him as an instrument fails or the individual may fail as an instrument, but that it will not fail. And that sounds kind of absolutist. And I don't know if maybe we need to talk about like what success means, um, because we could argue that, you know, we're still working at this and it hasn't necessarily worked. Um, you know, we have these leaders that practice nonviolence, but that have been assassinated. So how would you address that? Well, I would address it in various ways. Uh, first thing I want to say, Nicole, is we also have leaders who have not addressed questions with nonviolence, and they also have been assassinated. Mm -hmm. And I would say their assassinations have not helped to awaken the world. Mm -hmm. But the assassination of Martin Luther King has helped to awaken the world. Mm -hmm. And the assassination of Gandhi also. Mm -hmm. It awakened India like nothing else that he could have done mm -hmm. at that time. So, you know, in Satyagraha, we have this principle that King called it, uh, unearned suffering is redemptive. And I would say that voluntarily accepting, accepted suffering is redemptive. And that was the ultimate suffering, the ultimate price that they paid. Um, people have, for some reason, very unrealistic uh, um, assumptions and expectations about nonviolence. You know, how many wars have been fought? I mean, even in the last century, all these wars have been fought. Not one of them has brought peace and justice to the world. Mm -hmm. And somehow people don't stand up and say, war doesn't work. But you have one major nonviolence campaign. It also doesn't bring peace and justice mm -hmm. to the world in general. 
and people do say, hey, I, this shows that nonviolence doesn't work. When Gandhi said, actually, that was um, uh, B. R. Nanda, the, his, the historian, who said, you can, in Satyagraha, you can lose all the battles and go on to win the war. What they mean is, there's a force in nature, in human nature, which we're calling Satyagraha, and that force is no more arbitrary than gravity. Uh, you, you know, or electricity. They often use that analogy. So I turned on a light, which actually happened to me last week, turned on a light in my house, the darn thing didn't go off, didn't go on. Mm -hmm. So I'm not going to say electricity doesn't work. Mm -hmm. I say the light bulb was faulty. Mm -hmm. Now that's what Gandhi meant. Satyagraha is a force coming through him, but some self-will or some ego got in the way and obstructed that force from operating. He was modest enough to claim that. I know in my own experience in the free speech movement in Berkeley, we started out with these high ideals. We want to bring freedom of speech to campus. Within a couple of weeks and a few headlines in the newspapers, students are starting to act for the headlines and they forgot the goal. So at that point, the idealism and the drive really wasn't available for them anymore. So I think if you have realistic expectations that the world has been dedicated to violent policies for millennia, mm -hmm. we've only really had nonviolence in public view since the freedom struggle, since Gandhi. So it's, it's less than a century. So to expect that it will convert everything and the millennium will come in our lifetime, mm -hmm. that's unrealistic. I think once you get rid of that, you're really, you'll be amazed at how much it has accomplished. Like more than half the world mm -hmm. has made a significant change in their life mm -hmm. through one kind of nonviolence or another mm -hmm. since Gandhi and King. And it's become, you know, almost a household world, word. So when you realize that the infallibility refers to the force of nature, which is like a living force, uh, I thought of putting it this way this morning, you know, gravity and love are both forces. Gravity attracts objects and love attracts beings. You know, conscious beings are attracted by love the way physical objects are drawn together by gravity. But if I put an obstruction in the way of an object and it can't roll, I'm not saying that gravity doesn't work. Mm -hmm. And if I get selfish and I forget my goals and I'm thinking about only my own personal advantage, I'm not going to say that love doesn't work. Mm -hmm. I'm going to say that Michael failed. Mm -hmm. On that happy note. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.